Good evening. Welcome to the New York Public Library, whether you're joining us here in person or virtually. I'm Martha Hodes, Interim Director of the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers, and I'm very happy this evening to continue our fall lineup of conversations from the Coleman Center. Let me just make a few preliminary points. Please be aware that this event is being recorded. For those of you here with us, we do encourage you to wear a mask for the duration of the program, and we do have masks to give away. If you would like one, just give a signal and you can put one on, thank you. For virtual attenders, I just wanna make clear that real-time captions are available by clicking on the closed caption button, or for a live transcript, use the stream text link shared in the reminder email or chat. Okay, well, this evening, we gather to listen to a conversation between Coleman Fellow Vivek Narayanan discussing his new book entitled After with Pulitzer Prize winning poet Vijay Shashadri. Let me first just say a word about the Coleman Center. We select 15 fellows each year who come to the library to gain intensive access to our unparalleled collections in order to write the books of tomorrow. Our fellows are among the best and most promising academics and independent scholars, fiction writers and poets, journalists, translators, playwrights, and artists at work today. Writers and scholars from any country are welcome to apply, and the next cycle of our applications will be available on our website in June. Our next conversation with the Coleman Center takes place a week from today on October 18th, and that will be with the writer Hugh Aiken discussing his new book, Picasso's War, How Modern Art Came to America, in conversation with the art critic Mark Stevens. You can register for that or any of the other terrific events at the library at nypl.org slash events. You can also see everything that the library has to offer by signing up for our newsletter at nypl.org slash connect. All programs are made possible through the generosity of patrons like you, so do consider supporting the library however you can. If you have an NYPL library card or if you live in New York State and would like to apply for one, you can borrow tonight's book after for free, or you can buy the book from the library shop and proceeds do benefit the library. You can find links to buy the book on the event page, nypl.org slash conversations, or best of all, for those of you here in the room, you can buy the book and have it signed by Vivek right outside the door at the close of tonight's program. And on to tonight's program. Our guests will converse for 35 or 40 minutes and then take your questions. For those of you here with us, please use the cards and pencils that you see on the chairs to write out your questions and program staff will collect the cards shortly before Q&A. If you're joining us online, please share your questions in the chat or by emailing Center at nypl.org, and someone will be monitoring those questions. And now I would like to introduce our distinguished speakers. Vivek's interlocutor this evening is the poet Vijay Shashadri, author of five collections of poems and winner of the Pulitzer Prize. His work has appeared in The Nation and The New Yorker, He's also the recipient of the Arts and Letters Award for Literature for Exceptional Accomplishment and has been awarded fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Vijay teaches at Sarah Lawrence College and until this fall served as poetry editor of the Paris Review. Vijay speaks tonight with Vivek Narayanan who, hold, uh, who held a Coleman Center Fellowship in 2015-16. Vivek has published multiple volumes of poetry and his poems have been anthologized in the Oxford Poets Anthology and the Penguin Book of the Prose Poem. His poems, stories, essays, criticism, and translations have appeared in the Paris Review, The Village Voice, and Granta. Ever eclectic, VJ holds advanced degrees in historical anthropology from Stanford and creative writing from Boston University and he currently teaches creative writing at George Mason University. The book Vivek will discuss this evening, After, was inspired by the ancient epic poem, the Ramayana, originally composed in Sanskrit, and now reimagined and even reinvented for the 21st century in modern verse for modern times. The Harvard Review called it a remarkable book. 
please join me in a very warm welcome for Vijay Shashadri and Vivek Narayanan. Thank you. Thank you for having us, and, uh, and I want to express my gratitude to Vivek for choosing me to talk with him, uh, because, not only because the book is just an extraordinary, wild piece of imaginative work, but also because uh, of what I would call, I guess, and I think that's what I want to talk about with you first, the astrological element of its presence in the world at this moment. You know. <laughs> and of course, Indians are famous for their astrology, which is very sophisticated. And Indian astrologers could actually, uh, they had a working understanding of the Copernican theory of the solar system because they could predict uh, eclipses. And uh, so there's a lot of sophistication there. And... Uh, and I guess the appearance of this book at this moment <laughs> is, you know, from your point of view, either remarkably auspicious or remarkably inauspicious. <laughs> I don't know which, but, uh, you know, there's an intersection of the ongoing history of India and its an ancient culture and the place that uh, the Ramayana has in that culture with a development in, and I think you would agree with this, we were talking about it before, in Indian poetry and English, where I think in recent years it has arrived at a full maturity and become, you know, one of the major English traditions of the world. And that's happened through uh, the course of the history of the Indian Republic, but it's you know, the literature generally is intensified in the past 25 years, I think, and, uh, you know, roughly speaking. And, uh, and at this moment, it's sort of announcing itself in various ways, in various anthologies, and in the sense of uh, the confidence in, that Indian writers in English have about what they're doing and how their use of the language fits into their own historical and social experience. And... Uh, so the book stands at the intersection of those two things and, uh, and it is also coming in the 75th anniversary of the founding of the Indian Republic. And most significantly and complicatedly and problematically, it is about the text which is the most politically alive text in the Indian political landscape at this moment the Ramayana, which is uh, the source of tremendous energy and conflict and appropriation. And, uh, and, you know, and I think Vivek, we've been talking on and off all day about how we're gonna handle this conversation. And, uh, and have been a little befuddled, I think, as to where to start and how to deal with it, whether we're going to be political or whether we're going to be poetic or whether we're going to be, you know, we're gonna talk anthropologically about the manifestations of the Ramayana. And I guess, you know, I do wanna sort of start out with the poetics. And, uh, and I think I wanna ask you most pertinently about this sort of the, the generation of English language poets of which you are a part uh, and the relationship of this text to that work because that work tends to be in my experience of it and it's mostly through anthologies tends to be orthodox you know, it's highly formed now and it's very, very confident of itself. You know, this is a modernist text that you produce. So it's sort of in some way an appropriation of Western models that Indian writers have been a little distant from. And, you know, at least in my understanding of Indian writing in English. And I was wondering if you could start by just telling us, you know, 
how you came up with this really remarkably self-generated text that seems to, you know, peel back the layers in, you know, highly, I guess, unprecedented ways to get back to the original. Mm. Uh, well, it's not the original, but, you mm. know, it's sort of the, the, the umphalos of the Ramayanas. You know? Right. I mean, um, well, it, it, it's hard because I, I'm inside all of those things, so it's, it, it's, also, it's also hard to be, I mean, I, 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 I think of myself really as writing in the Indian English uh, poetry tradition, and um, and that that's that's been important to me, um, and um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like something is happening. I um, I think that one thing I feel which seems new is that is that. Um, the audience within India for Indian English poetry has really grown larger and also a lot more sophisticated. Um, and is, and now, I don't know, and now, you know, with the internet, it's kind of very au courant. So then, mm -hmm. so then you know, the, there's less of a, a kind of parochial mentality and more sort of uh, willingness to engage with world poetry. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the English scene, you know, some scenes like Malayalam have been that way for a while. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't think very much about audience when I was writing this. Mm -hmm. I, I tried to block out any thought of audience because, uh, yeah. in fact, and I just tried to work at the site of Valmiki. Right. Try to, uh, you know, try to make little things, uh, little edifices on the on top of the Valmiki. But, but. Um, you know, ultimately, I don't feel like I'm, you know, I had to do, I didn't really exp uh, make any compromises for yeah. a Western audience as yeah. such, and I didn't really, uh, and of course, you know, uh, New York Review Books was great for that, both because of the sure. list and the editor and sort of being encouraged to just to, to yeah. uh, you know, to explain less, if anything, you know, sure. and, 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 um, uh, and I could, but I, but I, when I realized I can also really count on a number of people who, uh, who, who somehow the book is speaking to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, the book is a beautiful artifact, and uh, you know, and it's the perfect place to publish it in America, I think, NYRB. And it's interesting to me in that regard because, uh, you know, there has been this constant engagement among Indian poets in English with the enormous mythology, you know. And what you get are, you know, Draupadi's night thoughts or something like that. Right, and, right. you know, and, and, you know, some of those poems are plausible. Many of them are cringeworthy, you know, because there's this incredible energy to these texts and, you know, an incredible vitality in the way they interact with the culture itself, you know, because this is a continuous culture and they are a part of its continuity. You know, this is the only really convincing piece of writing I've found that takes on, you know, the energy of those texts and responds and in some way you can see the energy reflected in this book, you know, and, uh, and the history sort of expanded out into a different, you know, in, into an artifact that sort of transforms it. So in one sense, it's like it is a modernist refraction and a reflection from a point of view that is not quite Indian right, but is not quite located anywhere else. It has, you know, the, you know, the decenteredness of a, of 
someone like Charles Olson or the decenteredness towards which Ezra Pound was working and never quite got there. And, you know, but at the same time, you really, you spent 12 years on it, you know, you got into it and you didn't come up with little lyrics that show that you appreciate what Valmiki did, you know? Right, right. I mean, it wasn't a question of art appreciation or cultural appreciation or cultural signaling, you know? But an authentic step forward in this ancient tradition, I think, you know? So I'm not asked, that's not a question, I guess. It's, you know. No, I, 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 it, yeah. it reminds me, you know, this um, uh, uh, Af uh, African uh, philosopher, Paulin Hotunji, he criticizes this idea that uh, many people have of kind of this unplaceable African philosophy that exists right. in the life. And he says, we need to focus on texts. We need to find out what the texts are and read them closely. And I think that often when people work with Indian mythology, they work with stories and in a very, very distant way. And I think that what um, changed for me was when I started to really get closer to the text uh -huh. and closer to the nitty-gritty of the text as opposed to just the story. Uh -huh. And um, and then that yielded all kinds of uh, a texture, you know? Right. And um, But I didn't realize I was doing this. I, I wasn't aware of this at the time, but then when I looked back, I realized I was, that was also a tradition going back to uh, Toru Dutt in the 19th century who um, is translating the Vishwa, uh, Puran, Vishnu Purana and then through to Kolatkar, um, you know, uh, Arvind Merotra's Kabir, which began as a set of improvisations, Ramanujan. So, so there's a long, there is this, it's a, it's a small tradition maybe, but, but there's a continuous tradition of Indian poets um, engaging closely with the text or engaging with this idea of translation. Mm -hmm. um, but something very different is at stake for them than just a straight translation, because at least like for instance with me, I'm trying to I'm trying to answer some questions for myself. I'm not trying to interpret this 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 culture for somebody else, you know. I'm trying mm -hmm. to interpret it for myself actually, figure right. it out for myself. And so then that I think that shifts away from the kind of clear translation to something very different, and so you get you know, uh, Ramanujan trying to take the um, Tamil classical poems and make it speak to Ezra Pound. Uh -huh. And, you know, you have Kolatkar trying to, so, they, so, they're, so they're trying to reconcile these things. And, and I feel like, um, you know, I'm sort of in, in that tradition, but it's, it's different from this kind of vague engagement with right. mythological stories that sometimes sure. can happen. Sure. Yeah. What's your relationship to Sanskrit? So, um, yeah, it's, it's a complicated relationship. I, um, you know, um, uh, it's, it's in my family. My grandfather was, uh, my grandfather, by the way, whose name was also Seishadri, was, uh -huh. uh, was a philosopher. And, um, and I grew up uh, reciting Sanskrit shlokas because my mother was the uh, religious education teacher at the Vivekananda Ashram. And, and, and um, that, the sound of those shlokas, I think was my earliest experience of something like poetry, that experience of rapture, to memorize that. And, and I've always felt when I write, I always hear that. I always hear, even when I write in English, I, I find myself, because that was my earliest experience. Uh, but then I really spent a lot of my life running away from Sanskrit because um, of, what it signified as a Brahminical language mm -hmm. and the violence of caste and, and the violence of, of, of um, Sanskrit hegemony, you know? And, and um, so, um, but, but eventually when I came back to it, what I found was because, uh, just precisely because I have this ambivalent relationship, I felt free to argue with what I was reading. Uh, and that was very liberating and kind of enabling. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I felt that once I could, rather than, as you said, uh, just valorizing the text, once I could take a critical stance to it, then all kinds of things started to, to open up, 
mm -hmm. um, for me uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. was, so was it a compulsion or was it a, something you saw as an opportunity, getting back to the Ramayana? Because oh. you had this Western experience and Western education and... Yeah, I mean, I in this case, it was really, it was um, uh, fortuitous. It's Arsha Sattar, who the book is dedicated to, uh, is, I think, a, a very original scholar of the Ramayana um, and also the translator of the Penguin, Abridged Valmiki, uh -huh. which is probably the best introduction to the actual Valmiki text. And so she called the workshop for Indian English poets working on the Ramayana. Uh -huh. Uh, to, to have us work, and we all showed up, um, but none of us was really interested in the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. We were all interested in the Mahabharata, which is supposedly sure. the messier, more complex text. And reading her translation, that's when I, f I first heard the call, because I realized the val this was not the book that I thought it was at all. Um, and then, you know, I, I just slowly got drawn into it somehow. I, I, I got, um, uh, uh, yeah, I just got, I just got, I just got pulled into it. I, I don't know how else to explain it. Uh -huh. it's, there's a, there's a, um, there's a story that Ramanujan tells about, you know, a stupid husband whose wife keeps sending him to the Ramayana and he's not interested in it. And the first night he falls asleep about five minutes into it. Um, you know, and it's it's the first first part of the Ramayana. In the morning, someone puts a sweet in his mouth, mm -hmm. and his wife asks him, "So how was it?" It's very sweet. Mm. Um, and then the second night, you get into some of the uh, the death of the father and um, death of the parent and those things that trouble us in the Ramayana. Again, he falls asleep in the first five minutes, but this time it's very crowded, and someone a kid is sitting on his shoulder the whole night. So when he wakes up and he goes back to his wife, he says it was very heavy. Uh, and then the third night, um, a dog pisses in his mouth. <laughs> uh, and so he goes back to his wife and he says, very bitter, you know. Um, and then the fourth night, somehow he stays awake, you know. And uh, this whole thing is going on and um, I'm trying to remember the details now, but maybe like the actor playing Hanuman or something is carrying a ring and the, they drop the ring on stage, and he says, I will save you, and he jumps there. So he's, so almost just by kind of sleepwalking, he's been pulled into the heart of the epic. Uh -huh. And I felt like that, I started this when my uh, daughter was born, and uh, I would go to the Saithi Academy and do these things and fall asleep. And then <laughs> suddenly, it's like I looked up and my hair is gray, <laughs> my daughter is 10 years yeah. old, and everything is Ramayana, and wow. how did that happen, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a very Indian story. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Do you want to read some of the poems? Yeah, um, I'd yeah. like you to read the Ravana poem because um, I published this poem. So, um, but you don't have to read it if you. Want. I will. I will. Uh, should I read just that one or read? No, I uh, mean. Okay. I think. Yeah. I mean, we have time. I think. We have so. time. Well, we have. It's six twenty-nine. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So. So. Uh, 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 it's always. And we do have to get to Hindutva. Right. Yeah. Um, well, let me uh, then maybe I'll read just two poems of that. Um, so. And what are the contexts of these? Uh, okay. So here, this is called here. Here, where by Shiva's laser eye, desire became a wisp of smoke forever free from the body, where in the tangle of trees and in the limbs and shoots that bind among them. The wind's fury entered the joints of beautiful boys and girls and bent them crooked where the sons of Sagara were born to dig the soil and tear the earth in search of a stolen horse, their progeny turned to heaps of ashes where the river Ganga brought 
the land to life after such devastation, only that the Asura angels might hope on to some settled end. Here, where memory burns like fat in the wildfires and in the altars that seek to tame them, where the deer is still afraid and the hunter blind. This forest was never new, Rama. It's not yours, not even after you've mastered it. Um, and uh, yeah, this was uh, the, this was the um, one of the weird poems that mm -hmm. the, the weird poem that Vijay was uh, <laughs> kind enough to publish. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, as you can see, some of these are are sort of um, I mean, these are these are all improvisations, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but I feel like that's in keeping with the tradition of the Ramayana because uh, the Ramayana is a history of. Uh, improvisations mm -hmm. and and in the oral tradition you know part of what you do as a bard is right. uh, you use the stock phrases and you you ring your changes yeah. um, but um, so um, this is this is uh, uh, the villain of the Ramayana um, uh, it's more complex than that um, but Ravana and at the heart of the Ramayana uh, like so many classical stories is an abducted woman. Um, so this is just before that as he approaches and, and Ravana is um, Brahmin by descent, half Brahmin. Um, and uh, he's fearsome, but now he's kind of um, dressed himself as a, as a humble Brahmin. Uh, but um, his arrival is uh, portentous, something like that. Ravana. Dressed simply, but not without elegance, holding ritual staff and parasol. Radiating gloom, like an asteroid with designs on a star, like night's curved shadow that swims across the earth, like the darkness of our sun in its deepest explosions, like the planet Pudan about to take hold of Rohini, like Saturn advancing on Chitra, like the forest and cities and far ridges of infinity, each planetary body with its moons, each moon that governs a foregone set of inhabitants, like the afterglow of a gamma ray burst, like the coma of gas that covers the nucleus of a comet, like comets, dirty snowballs, signing the skies with their anger, like the coronal hole stirring in solar wind, like clouds obscuring double stars of dwarf galaxies, like the Doppler reading suddenly shifted into the blue, like the black sphere of the event, like the flare in a field of view, like the imaginary mind on the galactic plane already hollow, like halos and brown disks with spiral arms, like Jupiter's bloodshot eye, like a supernova in its galactic host, like the warm-blooded animal's infrared glow, like the ionized air, like the untold spheres of the Kuiper belt, like the light curve of an astral orb diminishing in relation to time like molecular clouds stanching all light behind them, like the protoplanet revealed in the eclipse, like our own moon in its uncountable rills, like the Jovian body with its back to the sun. Hmm. It's terrific. Yeah. I guess we should say to the audience that uh, it's not a book of poems, <laughs> you know, even though there are those lyric moments, two of which you introduced us to, that those lyric moments are a part of a kind of epic unfolding, uh, a constant wrestling with the text. 
you know. And uh, and one of the satisfactions of the book for me is that it's the wrestling occurs at a standstill. Y you know, it's kind of continuous and ongoing, and it's open ended, and uh, you know, so it has that epic quality and. Uh, and that's one of the really satisfying things to me about it, you know. And I'm glad that we sort of ended in, you know, the universe familiar to the Webb telescope because, you know, we can return to the sort of astrological theme that the other really relevant fact of the publication of your book now is its relationship to, I guess, and for some of us, uh, puzzling, and for many of the people I know in India, quite disturbing, and for myself, also quite disturbing. But not of all of the people I know in India, because, you know, I know some of these Brahmins you talk about you just talked about, and they're quite happy at the turn of events. And, uh, and uh, this book comes at a time here and in India where this particular text, not necessarily this text, I think primarily the version of the story told by Tulsidas in the 16th century is uh, at the center, at the very, very center of Indian politics and at the very center of developments that make us fear for India. And, uh, and I know because you, it's a part of the writing that you are very much concerned with the relationship of the text to that, you know, not only re the relationship of the text to its kind of uh, historical Brahminical past, but its BJP present. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, in a way that was also just part of the um, resources I had available to me, uh, I mean, a kind of a poetic resources. Uh, through the Ramayana because it's this text that over a very long period of time acquires all these layers and um, and even uh, and, 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 and it basically emerges out of um, an oral bardic tradition mm -hmm. which is incredibly diverse and uh, contentious and reading Valmiki closely although this is now the Bardic, it's a lower caste Bardic tradition. Mm -hmm. And so the Sanskrit we're reading uh, is probably is some appropriation of that oral tradition, elite appropriation. Um, but still, I, I, you know, you get the sense that they were trying to capture the diversity of the Ramayana tradition when they were doing this because uh, there are a number of contradictions, there are open contradictions there are multiple, multi-forms, like stories that are very similar, that are just told with slight variations. And so they're already sort of gathering uh, the contentiousness. And, and really, uh, the Ramayana becomes a site of contest, um, going right through uh, to the 20th century when you have, um, like for instance, Periyar, the South Indian reformer who uses it to crit critique uh, North Indian hegemony, and then goes on, and, and the first uh, text in independent India, banned in independent India, was the Ramayana. And then you get the uh, TV serial in the 80s, which, and then, of course, the uh, demolition of the Babri Masjid mo Mosque. So the, the Ramayana is tied to the Hindu right, uh, or the Hindu right has tried to appropriate the Ramayana and make it their text and their text alone. Um, so, I mean, it's strange because I, I worked on this book over uh, 10 years, 12 years, and when I started, work, started working, I mean, and in that time, the political landscape in India has, I think, changed beyond recognition. Yeah. And the first turning point was, uh, I think, 2014, 
I was here at Kalman when that happened, and the unthinkable happened, and Modi was voted in. Uh, unthinkable, at least for us, you know, uh, liberals and lefties. Um, and, um, and then the second turning point was 2019, when they were uh, went, voted in for a second term, and just as how people fear a Trump second term, you know, this, all the things, it's just um, the, yeah. the whole thing became a lot more brazen. And um, so over this period of time, so when I first started it, I thought, okay, it's controversial, but maybe not. About uh, 2014, when I was here <laughs> and working on it here, uh, and, and I thought, okay, wow, this could be uh, contentious text to work on because uh, of the Modi government. But at that time, you know, I was still just going through li Valmiki line by line, and I didn't want to get too much into the politics because I wanted to make a text that could last, mm -hmm. you know. But by, but by 2019, I really started to feel it would be unethical for me to not address, uh, you know, that kind of uh, all-encompassing Islamophobia and um, you know authoritarianism, and and I, I felt it. I felt I had to address it, and I had the resources to address it because, um, you know, I was reading the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. You know, you talk of those twelve years, and then the transformation, and then the arrival of your book at this particular moment. And uh, I was in India this summer, and. Uh, I was astonished at the extent to which the BJP has consolidated power. And you know, and you cannot deny the fact that these stories are implicated in that yeah. because they have a way of providing unity to a country that wants to be disparate, you know, and they provide a vehicle and it doesn't matter, it seems to me, that the Valmiki itself, the reason that it was the story it represents had such, you know, uh, carrying power. You know, not just across the subcontinent, but in Southeast Asia, you know, there's a vast sort of semantic field. Yeah the the stories of the Ramayana cover, and especially in theater, especially in local theater, and in you know in theater like the Ram Lila, and it's been going on and on and on because there's something so open ended about it, right? And the fact that they want to make it a closed text, and that they're using it as one element in this incredible and frightening consolidation, uh, is sort of you know it's not another one of the ironies that keeps this. You know, this phenomenon that is the Ramayana alive, I mean, it's really sort of, uh, and it wasn't, uh, I mean, I think we only have one minute and then we're going to open up the, the floor to questions, but uh, I was in Shimla and uh, when I first got to India and uh, the British, you know, they made it their summer capital, Shimla. It's in the Himalayas, and uh, if you've never been to the Himalayas, you should go. You know, they make the uh, Rockies look like sand hills. <laughs> They're just so astonishing, the mountainous. And, uh, and the reason the British found Shimla, I don't know if you know this, is that uh, on the ridge above what is the mall at Shimla, where Christ Church is, and, you know, where is it's recognizable to you if you've read Kipling's Mrs. Hawksby stories. And uh, there's a ridge above the mall, and uh, Hanuman supposedly put his foot on that ridge when he was on his way to the mountains to find a sacred herb to save Lakshmana, who had been poisoned. And, uh, and that is now dominated by this enormous monolithic statue of Hanuman <laughs> that was built during the BJP period. And uh, it's kind of like, wow, you know, that uh, this is so alive. So over Christ's church, you know, there is looming this enormous statue of Hanuman. So I don't know. Have you seen that statue? <laughs> I haven't in Shimla. Uh -huh. No, I haven't seen the one in Shimla, but I, I'm sort of uh, 
familiar with the gargantuan Hanumans. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Hanumans are all over the place. Yeah, and they're getting taller and taller. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that I think that the project, I mean, in a way, the Hindu nationalist project is to sort of create this kind of unified thing that is united against supposedly outsiders. And, um, and so they want to create this singular Ramayana, which then they will control the meaning of. But as we discussed, you know, the, the, the greatness of the Ramayana, that what makes it a great text is because it embodies all these different possible readings and different possible tellings, and it's, it's this kind of inherently diverse text. So, I mean, I hope that, I, I, I mean, I, I, so, so I think, I mean, um, I hope that they won't succeed, and I don't think they will succeed, because, um, you know, the, the variousness of the Ramayana um, has, uh, has been going for so many, for so long, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, should we take some questions now? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, so I'm going to choose, like, you know, the ones that I might have asked. I hope that's okay. Uh, this is, question is, tell us more about those 12 years. Was then an arc of progress or something more complicated? Um, something more complicated, I guess. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, a lot of it was really felt like feeling around in the dark. Um, but, but where I started was really um, just looking at certain passages and just, just working with passages. So then I found myself just collecting fragments, you know, and, I, and, I, um, and that was a concern for a long while because I'm just, I'm, uh -huh. I, you know, everything I do, everything is kind of fragment and, you know, Schlegel has talked about fragments, right? It, it's, they, they, they're always pointing to something else outside sure. of them. Yeah. And um, so, um, but I was, you know, I was discovering so much. And it was a, you know, it was a very long process. Started with looking at English translations and at some point, um, you know, working with tutors to get into certain passages in the Sanskrit and eventually, you know, being able to do that by myself and, and, and um, but I, I think the key turning point for me uh, was when uh, one of my uh, tutors taught me uh, a tune for reciting the Ramayana. Mm. And uh, so when I could recite a verse and, and sometimes memorize it and just feel that you know, that meter kicking into place in the satisfying way, then I, I felt like, okay, maybe I have, I have something to offer here that the scholars uh, don't. And uh, so that was kind of a turning point. Um, but it, you know, and, uh, but, but slowly the shape of the book emerged and I realized that, uh, you know, that, 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 uh, that, I, that Valmiki, you know, that there was a lot going on in the Valmiki, so I didn't, you know, I, you know, if I, if I wasn't sure, all I'd just get out of the way and just try to make the text speak, you know, uh -huh. um, because, um, uh, so I, so I started to feel the confidence of, um, you know, standing on the shoulder, standing on top of this, this thing that was vast, and, and, um, and in the end, you know, in my previous books, I've always, um, agonized about the ordering of the poems it, it drives me nuts you know and and um, but strangely I didn't have to do that here because this, uh -huh. there's already a, something these fragments are referring to and then somehow it all just I've never had that experience with with uh, poems where everything just fit into the order because it was it felt like it was plugging and in, fitting into place somewhere uh -huh. um, but yeah, but no, there was there was uh, there was no plan, and I always thought, you know, at any point I thought it was going to be a year away. I was like, okay, I'm going to finish it next year, and then, and then that went on. So, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Okay. I had a question, but I'm not going to. You know, I'm going to read something else. Uh, what are the challenges of translating Sanskrit texts into English? 
which elements of the original are most likely to get lost in translation? All of them, I mean. <laughs> but, um, okay. well, I, you know, th this, this um, uh, you know, this book is, none of these poems are translations in any uh, conventional right. sense, but the book is constantly kind of flirting or sort of exploring the idea of translation. And so, um, so, so, so often there are multiple takes of a certain passage, you know, where I can kind of bring out, try to, try to bring out different things in those multiple takes. You know, one of those takes might be just sound, uh -huh. you know, and, um, and there's a poem there called uh, Kumbhakarna Sound System, uh, which is a poem in the Sanskrit, it's just an explosion of sound. Sure. So I just got a friend of mine who's a kind of experimental composer based in Chennai uh, to write a kind of experimental score. So, um, so I was just trying to get at this in any way, knowing, right, knowing that, that ultimately, for me, you know, even a translation, it's not about being... Uh, you know, there's, there are resp ethical responsibilities in a translation, but it's not about just about being faithful. It's about bringing something new into the language in which yeah. you're writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that connects to the next question because uh, someone asked, you know, could you comment on the title after? Right. Right. And that's sort of uh, a tradition in American poetry where people write versions that aren't, translations but are inspired by poems in other languages and and I think you're using the title ironically or you, you're using it in fairly complicated ways right it's not simply that this is after Valmiki in the sense yeah. that you know. correct I mean I mean it, it is it is that too because it's kind of playing with the the sort of after tradition but I mean but when I really knew that I mean, the point at which I knew this was going to be the title of the book is, um, uh, so, you know, uh, Valmiki has seven books. And um, at the end of the uh, sixth book, uh, you know, Ravana is killed, the war ends, and Sita is returned. Uh, but then there's a seventh book uh, called Uttarakanda, uh, where, you know, everything unravels. All, the, the, all the, the, the successes of the kingdom, everything seems to fall apart. Um, and, and, uh, and that's also the book where Rama dies. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, you know, everybody dies and so on. And, and um, so, there's a, so, so that's called the Uttarakanda. And Uttara could be later uh, or after. Uh, so, so, um, so I realized that, I mean, I mean this book, this last book of the Ramayana, even though it's uh, so problematic, was key in a way because it's, you know, it's like after the happy ending, then, you know, sure. it's like the, the prince ends up banishing his, yeah. you know, the king ends up banishing his wife, right. you know, to the, the forest while she's pregnant and all of this stuff happens. Um, so um, so that, was, that was one thing. And then I started, you know, really thinking about the aftermath of violence um, because uh, a big theme of the book is the relationship between poetry and violence, and also I think the Ramayana. So, so what does it, you know, what does it mean to come after this, uh, this, all this history, this 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 violent history, and and you know, where do you go from there uh, after you know this this kind of legacy or this history of violence? Yeah, that was one yeah. thing I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, one of uh, A.K. Ramanujan, if those of you who don't know, who's a wonderful scholar of Indian texts whom, uh, who you mentioned. And, uh, and he had uh, a terrific metaphor about the epics that, and it was from crystallography, if you remember that, that crystals form right. in the flaws in old crystals, that's how crystals grow, that there are flaws occurring, and, there, and not flaws in the sense of errors or failures, but fissures and uh, seams, and it's that, that's where new crystals form, and, uh, you know, and I think 
this is certainly kind of, uh, the pertinence has to do with that, that somehow the interest in this book really has to do with the fact that it's an organic formation out of uh, seams and elements and gaps and fissures in the old text that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and there, there, you know, the, the, when you start to read the Ramayana more deeply, you realize there are all these questions at the heart of it. And there are questions that don't seem to resolve themselves. And any attempt to kind of resolve it only leads to more problems, you know, and, and so it's, uh, it's this kind of, the, this attempt to, f to finally answer that question, but then that just seems to lead to, you know, more questions and, and so yeah. on. Yeah, so uh, I guess, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Okay. I'll give you the biggest one. <laughs> Is the Ramayana 100% mythology? You mean, in other words, is, is there something uh, factual in it? Uh, like, well, did I, it really I happen? I guess the questioner means mythology versus history. Would that be the kind That's of... That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, well, I, actually, it, you know... Because um, the BJP says it's history, right? Right, right, right. And... and um, you know, I, I at the end of the book, I I I quote, I quote my grandfather. He he wrote a book called The Heritage of Hinduism, and um, and he says he says that the, those early Hindu texts are not concerned with history, but they're concerned with how um, time merges or emerges in the eternal. Uh, so they're, they're, they're not interested really, um, I mean, um, with that. And so, so, if, so if, there, if there are truths, if there are questions in the Ramayana, they're not meant to be, I think, you know, factual or anything like that. Um, but um, at the same time, like, say that war that happens in the Ramayana, there's a kind of intensity to it. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole conquest of the South. There, there are things that happen it that that are um, that seem so intense that they. I feel like they must be channeling uh -huh. the memory of something. You know, the memory of some uh, events that happened. Sure. But they're not doing it in a in a in in a, in a in a historical way because they're not interested in in history. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in some sense, it is the question, right? Because <clears throat> there are ways to avoid it. There are so many ways to avoid it, you know. You can say, well, what do you mean by history? What do you mean by mythology, right? And that's a way to wriggle off the hook and, uh, you know. And, you know, and I think the one thing about the political situation is they're not wriggling off the hook. You know, they kind of want to be on that hook. They don't want, you know, ambiguity is, yeah. you know, which is at the heart of India. I mean, India is, you know, the most ambiguous place on earth, as far as I can tell. I mean, so I mean, I, I think one of, the, sorry. Yeah. No, I mean, one of the things that drives uh, what the BJP does in terms of saying, you know, this is where the Ramayana happened and this is where uh, Hanuman jumped off or whatever, that's a natural tradition in the Ramayana where you kind of localize it. Uh, and the most telling example I, I thought was in Trinidad. You know, the Ramayana is mapped onto that landscape and that mountain was in the Caribbean was where, Ram where Hanuman jumped. Really? Yeah, and, and so, so, so everywhere you go, people find, and, um, and in Nasik, which I write about in the book, you know, there is a whole Ramayana tour. This is where this happened, this is where that happened. And you realize a lot of the stories are coming out of Tulsidas, which means they must date no later than the 17th century, right. you know. But um, so there's a, so there's something very beautiful about the way the Ramayana binds itself to local landscapes uh -huh. and to space. Yeah. Um, that unfortunately is now being uh, confused with history and, and a sort of uh, uh, Hindu supremacy and all that stuff mm -hmm. and and also to supposedly you know to, to find uh, 
you know, to, uh, to find that to find a, uh, the Rama temple underneath the mosque, as it were. You know, that that whole thing, which is really just a land grabbing exercise yeah. at the end of the day. But yeah, sure, yeah, and uh, right? okay. Uh, I guess uh, we've run out of time, so uh, that was a great conversation. That was very illuminating, and uh, and the book is fantastic. After. Thank you.